Today we are going to pick up on a class that we began four weeks ago. And the topic has been, it started off as how was Jesus tempted uh, in the wilderness. And it's more, it, it's uh, expounded on that to the point of being victorious over the tempter. That's where we want to lead everyone. Uh, like the conclusion of understanding how was Jesus tempted in the wilderness. So today I plan to wrap that up. I just wanted to, uh, just for everyone's benefit, um, I just wanted to cover just, you know, the highlights very quickly, the points that we've touched on in the first four. And I encourage you, you can catch all of those at the website at mycashministries.com. So, We've discussed, um, I'm just going to read some points I jotted down that we've covered. Uh, the Spirit of God did not lead Jesus into the wilderness. And that is such an important point uh, for us to know. And I explained that in those, but we went over that point. Uh, we also discussed how God does not tempt any man with evil. And we also discussed how Jesus did not see the devil. He did not see a physical shape. He didn't see anything. Uh, and, uh, but, uh, and we also talked about how, you know, if we were to go any place, the devil leads us and yield our will to him to go to that place that we would be in sin. And we discussed how if Jesus did the same thing, he would also. And, uh, the main point I think that we discussed and how many of you in the class would agree that the main point of the you know, those first two classes was showing that uh, the Bible says in Hebrews that uh, he is tempted in, that we are tempted in all things as Jesus was, uh, but he didn't sin. So what we're, what we were drawing on is in any way that we are tempted, Jesus experienced temptation the same way. Okay. And uh, that's very important to understand so that Through education, we were just talking about in class before we began how the enemy has used education to move our minds away from the spiritual realm. And uh, so if you you can't see it, hear it, smell it, touch it, or taste it, according to the natural mind and education of the world today, it's not real. And that is a deception by the enemy so that he can work freely in your life to kill, steal, and destroy. So we went over some of those points, and we're actually going to continue on that point uh, to lead us to a conclusion today. And then we spent a little bit of time talking about, and I want to kind of pick up here on these last two points, is, um, you know, the evil spirits uh, that left their first estate, according to Jude and and 1 Peter, uh, they are twice dead, which we saw from the scriptures. You'll have to listen to teaching. I don't want to go into that again. But they're twice dead, and uh, therefore they have no physical or spiritual shape uh, that they can be discerned by. The only way you can recognize an evil spirit is by their personality that is, that is manifested through people. Okay, Or we saw in one case last week also through animals. Their personality is the same and no matter what they inhabit. And it's really much of their personality, as we saw, we're going to see also here today, is that it's self-preservation because they have a fear of being destroyed. And that's why whenever an evil spirit is present, you will feel, especially anyone that's discerning of the spirit or uh, has the indwelling spirit, will feel an uneasiness about someone that you're talking to, Uh, you'll discern that, hey, something ain't right here. And that's because there's an evil spirit uh, present. And uh, they could either be inhabiting the person or just hanging out with them. Uh, Either way, you're going to discern that. All of us have been in place, you know, I've walked into stores and I all of a sudden I feel like this is not a good place. (laughs) You know what I mean? Uh, This is not a good place. Even if I go down into Manitou, it's a good place to... Uh, practice your discernment. <laughs> you know, you can walk by people and you just feel the oppression of the enemy in them. I know. And, uh, yeah, yep. 
Yeah. And I, I, uh, I spent a few years in California near the beach, near a place called Venice, California. And that's like a Mecca for evil spirits. It's, it is. They got everything but the big black square building, you know, <laughs> but they hang out there in, in uh, great numbers. So um, I wanted to pick up on the point we ended with last week or discussing and applying it to us also is I was comparing and contrasting evil spirits with the angels of God. And um, I think the simplest way to, ex to express about the angels of God, and maybe for sake of time, I won't read all the scriptures, but uh, where, wherever it talks about the, uh, the angels of God, it's interesting, like um, they are, well, let's just go someplace we're familiar with, uh, the resurrection, okay? What do we hear? We see, in fact, I'm going to read this. Let's go to Luke 24. Let's go to Luke 24, and I'll read a, uh, a parallel account also of the same in, uh, listen to this. It says, and this is common uh, throughout the scriptures, and the angels are never written of in any other uh, expression other than what we're about to read. And it says, verse 1 of Luke 24 says, Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and, and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass that they were much perplexed thereabout. When they were much, as they were much perplexed, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces, they said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but risen. Remember how he spake unto you, saying, Anyway, uh, they remembered the words, and uh, but it, the point I want to make out is it says they found two men. Were they two men? The other, other accounts say uh, in uh, Mark and Matthew, it talks about how the angels rolled away the stone. And I believe it's in Matthew where they actually says the angel sat upon the stone and the uh, Roman soldiers that were there trembled for fear and just passed out. You know what I mean? But uh, notice how these angels have a discernible shape and their discernible shape is as a man. True? So let's look at a parallel account of this same thing. It just adds a few details that are very important. In John chapter 20, it tells us there, uh, let's see here. In John chapter 20, uh, Let's just start in verse, uh, verse 11. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher and seeth two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. So again, the point I want to make is in uh, Luke, it says that they saw two men. And here it calls those same two men, two angels. So what is their appearance? Their appearance is like you and I. There's also another interesting uh, point about angels is Jesus said, I believe it's in Mark, where he said that angels are neither male nor female. Okay, they don't have a gender. And what's interesting is never once in the scriptures is there a female angel. In other words, there's no one where they think it's a female angel. There's no distinguishing features for uh, in the scriptures where it is said, oh, it was a, you know, it was a lady. You know, it never says there were two women sitting at the, you know, at the thing. But uh, I don't know. I've grown up and I've heard all sorts of testimonies about people entertaining strangers unaware, Hebrews 13, where they describe the person they met as a woman. Okay, we've, we've all heard that. But as far as the scriptures go, 
there's not one account from Genesis through Revelation where it likens them unto appearing as a woman. I'm not saying it can't happen uh, because of Hebrews chapter 13. It tells us that, you know, we can entertain a stranger unaware and a stranger could be a woman to us. Amen. And then another, another uh, good point here, and I encourage you to go over these, just look these up for yourself, uh, is in Daniel. Daniel describes in uh, Daniel 8 and 9, he, when, he, uh, when the angel Gabriel appears to him, he actually describes him as, you know, one having the appearance as a man. And uh, he describes him, you know, f- all the physical characteristics that we have as men or as people. And there's not one account in the entire Bible where Satan or any evil spirit appears that way, okay? So uh, I just wanted to bring that out, that contrast there, because it's another example of Satan uh, when, when they lost their first estate, as it says in Jude, and they were twice dead, plucked up by the roots. It shows that one of those deaths they'd experienced, not death in the sense of ceasing to exist, but death meaning separation. They were separated from two things. What were they separated from? Well, we know they were separated from the Spirit of God, His very presence, and uh, the Spirit that they had like we receive when we're born again. But what was the other thing they were separated from? Well, the only other thing God gave them in addition to creating them out of eternal spirit, because he made them out of himself, uh, was the shape that all the other angels had. We don't see the evil spirits having that. So that's anymore. So we see that as the second separation. So you might be, you might meet somebody on the street or in a dark alley or somewhere that you'd say, I think I just met the devil himself. But no, what you've met is an evil spirit that's inhabiting uh, the body of another person or they're dwelling there also. And last week we talked about in in great detail, and I'm going to add a couple of points to that this week, which I think is very important in discerning how was Jesus tempted and how we are tempted. These are very important points for all of us to know and understand. And just let me digress for a second. If they weren't important, there would not be so much in the Bible about this subject. Remember, everything that pertains unto life and godliness is preserved for us in the word of God, not just in written form, but through revelation of the spirit who uses the word, the dried ink on a page to speak to us. Okay. But it's not limited to that. Okay. But it's very important that we understand this because of the volume of this subject in the word. It was very important to God or he wouldn't have spent that much time so that we could know and discern that. Amen. Y'all agree? Amen. And so um, I was uh, talking about the man at the Gadarenes, how uh, his personality, the personality of the evil spirits were actually manifesting in this man. And how were they? They were unruly. They were loud. They were destructive. They caused him to hurt himself. All of these. So if you see any of these behaviors in a person you can recognize that there's an evil spirit present, whether it's a learned behavior from an evil spirit that they're just carrying on because they've been well-trained or they're actually inhabiting the person still to this day. And uh, so it's very important to know uh, that because you know how to communicate to them. Notice how Jesus, which we talked about last week, but I'm going to touch on it again so we can go to the next scripture, how Jesus spoke to the man, but he didn't speak to the man directly. He spoke to what was speaking out of the man. Okay. And that's what he said. What is thy name? And who was in control? Well, we know the evil spirit was in control because that's who replied. 
Now, many people, we say, hi, I'm so-and-so, what's your name? And they don't say, oh, I'm Legion or whatever. <laughs> you know, if you do, I recommend you take one step backward and respond with the name of Jesus, okay? But uh, it didn't happen in that case because the man had surrendered complete control to these evil spirits to where there wasn't just one influencing his thinking, they were actually ruling over him to the point where they were using his lungs, tongue, vocal cord to communicate in a verbal form. Amen? And uh, that's important for us to understand because just because you don't see that in your life doesn't mean that you're not uh, oppressed or the person you're dealing with is not oppressed with an evil spirit. Again, the case in point that I contrasted last week, and please get that teaching, it goes into much greater detail, but the man in Mark chapter 1 that Jesus cast the spirit out of, you know, let's just call him Judah for, you know, Judah had been coming to that synagogue for years, and everybody thought he was just a crotchety old guy, but, uh, you know, but they didn't really know or discern what was in him. But when Jesus was there, the evil spirits were so afraid and so uh, like they just felt trapped that they just, you know, used this man to speak out of. He said, we know who you are, uh, you know, Jesus, thou, you know, son of God. And, and Jesus immediately set a weight upon them. He rebuked them and told them to loose that man. And and man, he just, they, it says he threw him out in their midst and, and tore him. And uh, so just because you might commune with somebody over and over again, and they have this personality that's rough and rude or, or uh, even where they don't talk much at all, where they're silent a lot, uh, that doesn't mean that's just their personality. It could be that they have an evil spirit. That, and the only way you're going to find that out is if you are Jesus with skin on. Because that's what brought out the evil out of that man in the, in the synagogue. And it wasn't just because of his presence there. It was because of what Jesus was sharing. That's what brought the enemy out. The truth. Jesus said the truth will make you free. Amen? And just like I believe, you know, there's no way to confirm this, but uh, I would say the, the weight of the rest of the word bears this out, is I believe that because God is drawing all men unto Jesus, when Jesus stepped on the shore of that uh, cross in that lake, uh, in that place where the man of the Gadarenes was, that the, the man discerned that there was deliverance in Jesus. He didn't, couldn't explain it or didn't know what it was, but I believe he of his own volition ran to Jesus and fell at his feet because he wanted to be free, but he was trying to get rid of these evil spirits. And, but they still had dominion over him. And it says, when we read the accounts last week, you'll see that the conversation occurs because Jesus commanded those evil spirits to come out of him. Okay, and they resisted. They didn't come out immediately. They bargained with Jesus. You know, hey, well, okay, we'll come out if we you let us go into the swine. <laughs> you know what I mean? So uh, I'm, I'm bringing these thoughts out because that's what they are. They're thoughts. And uh, they might be expressed with words to you through a person, or they might just be a thought in your own mind. And if you understand and see this communication at its spiritual level, at its spiritual root in the Word, then you'll, you'll be hearing what the Spirit is telling you more clearly. See, the Spirit knows when you've encountered an evil spirit. You don't have to have the hair stand up on the back of your neck, okay? Nor do you have to hear some deep voice, you know, coming out of a woman and uh, to know that it's an evil spirit. In fact, the ones that you are probably the most destructive evil spirits are the ones who don't manifest like that. Those are the ones that keep people bound to destroy in other people's lives through that person. Okay. 
And those are the ones we want to have discernment about. Think about if you're in a crowd or a group of people that aren't, aren't Christian and you begin ministering truth about God, in many cases, you're going to have someone that's going to stand up and, or speak up and say, oh, that's a bunch of, you know, you fill in the blank. And it's not that person. It's because of the lies that the evil spirit has persuaded them of. And he's feeling very uncomfortable in that position, especially if you're between him and his only way out the door. Okay. That's going to make them very nervous. Okay. Let's look at another account here. Uh, I'm going to come back to that particular point about discerning thoughts, but I want to stay on the track of comparing the evil spirits and how they manifest with angels. So uh, the angels are very clear. I think the two scriptures I read are sufficient. You'll just read several over. They'd say the same thing, how the angels always appear. They're in a fi- uh, what we would call a shape that looks just like a human being, a man is how they appear. But go with me to, to Acts chapter 19. Here's another good account uh, that expresses this very, uh, demonstrates this uh, very well. Uh, And I'm going to start in verse 11, just to read into it. It says, Acts 19, verse 11, it says, And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out of them. Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preacheth. And when, and when there were seven, oh, and there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leapt on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house, wounded and naked. And and this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. So a couple interesting points here is, one, inside of this man was an evil spirit. And the he was known to have an evil spirit. How would people know that he had an evil spirit? Well, it was manifesting something outwardly, a personality that wasn't godly or wasn't like everyone else around them. Neutral, you might say. And so these, these guys who had heard about the name of Jesus thought, well, uh, and they called themselves exorcists, Uh, they were going to set this man free. And I don't, obviously it wasn't for setting the man free as much as it was maybe that was their profession or that was their, you know, way to get attention or, you know, gain some notoriety. But the evil spirit in that man did not recognize their authority. Why didn't he recognize them as an authority? See, they were speaking the name of Jesus, but they did not believe in the name of Jesus, nor did they believe in the power that comes when you have belief in that name of Jesus. So the devil discerned that right away in this person, and he did not yield to that name of Jesus. He said, Paul, I know, and Jesus, I know, but who are you? Okay, and see, many times I'm going to, well, I'll just say this. Many times we who believe in Jesus and have had teaching on our authority over the power of the enemy, many times when we speak to the enemy, we get the same result here. We get this like, well, who are you? (laughs) Jesus, I know. Andrew Womack, I know, but who are you? You know what I mean? How many, just be honest for a moment. I felt that way. I've, I've commanded an evil spirit and I felt like he was just looking at me like, 
And what do you want me to do with that? <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and, and I felt that way inside the resistance against me. And, uh, but that was the enemy no different than with Jesus, with the man at the Gadarenes. Jesus did not budge an inch when he knew that he was face to face with over a thousand evil spirits in this man. In fact, he called him out and said, who are you? <laughs> you know what I mean? He put the enemy on the defensive. So just because you might feel the enemy push back at you, if these men had really believed in the name of Jesus, then they would have said, well, meet us. We also know Jesus. And they would not have accepted him pushing back at them. But because they didn't have that confidence through the truth of God's word, they didn't really believe in Jesus in the same way that Paul did, uh, that they were able to be physically overcome and beat up. But I want you to notice that, again, same case, no different than when Jesus rebuked Satan in Peter, this man was being used by an evil spirit and he was communicating with audible words through the vocal cords of this man. Now, what do we see different about the angels? The angels spoke audibly to uh, Mary uh, and those that were at the tomb. They heard them speak to them audibly, but they weren't using anyone else's voice. They were using their own voice that they had uh, within them that was part of the body that they had that they were appearing to them in. If you'll read in all the accounts uh, where angels are mentioned, not just as a vision, but also as appearing as a physical, they are communicating of their through their own physical, or I'm using that just to relate the point, it's actually spiritual, but through their own physical presence, where evil spirits don't have that because they lost all of that that gave them that ability. And again, I'll bring up this point. That is why evil spirits want to inhabit human beings. Because just like we were created in the image of God, angels were also created in the image of God. And, and uh, so they don't have that means of expression that we have any longer. They don't have any longer the means of expression that we have now in the same way God has that expression which was demonstrated in the person of Jesus Christ, whom God was his father. And uh, so, uh, so the evil spirits have to get inside of a person who yields to them in order to be able to use their physical faculties to communicate, okay? And we talked a little bit last week about, you know, uh, different ways that evil spirits manifest, and we talked about autism, how uh, the different manifestations of autism we see are demonic because like Jesus cast dumb spirits out, okay? And many times autistic kids won't speak. They'll be, they won't speak. They'll have outbursts, they'll scream, they'll yell, uh, but they won't communicate, okay? And it's typical of evil spirits. And we talked a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to show you a contrast that whenever the angels appear, there's always, although people are afraid, the angels are always presenting something with peace. They're never confrontive, okay? They're always ministering peace because God said that if you know the word, that you'll have great peace and you'll never be offended. So the angels never come across as being defensive, Angels of God never come across as being offensive. They're always bold, but they're not offensive, loud, or rude. They're always there yielding to the person's will, okay? Now, they have limits themselves that they are bound by the word and the commission that God gave them where they won't they won't deviate from that in any way whatsoever. Case in point was Balaam 
uh, Balaam's ass. And uh, the ba angel told Balaam, he said, if your ass had not turned away the three times that it had, you'd be dead right now because I was sent to stop you. And this is how I was going to stop you with this sword. Now, it wasn't he was going to chop off his head. He was just going to uh, take his life from him. In other words, Balaam, who did believe in the Lord, would have gone straight into paradise, and, uh, but he would have lost his physical life here on earth. And, but the angel was there, and he had certain bounds, just like in uh, Exodus chapter 23, when the children of Israel were being delivered out of Egypt and they were getting ready to go on their journey to the promised land, uh, the uh, God, through his, the angel of his presence, admonished uh, Moses. He said, now I'm sending my angel with you. But he said, don't disobey him because my name is in him and he will not pardon your transgression. Now, and we see what that meant was that for every transgression, there is a consequence, consequence and we see in James that that leads to death, okay? Sin leads to death. So that angel could not deviate from that judgment in any way whatsoever. So that's why God warned Moses, hey, my angel is not going to pardon your transgression. How was the angel able to pardon the transgression? He wasn't able to. That's why you see over and over through that whole time in the wilderness, Moses would say, Aaron, go offer a sacrifice quick. And it would say, because the plague had gone out, the death had gone out. And uh, the angel didn't have the option to choose. When that sin breached that line, then instantly the consequence went forth. It couldn't, it couldn't pardon their transgression. But God would restrain the angel and say, stop. And that's what would happen in every case. We see that also again when David was in, in uh, reigning as king, the thought came to him by the enemy. It says in uh, Chronicles that Satan stood up to tempt David and he tempted him to count all the people. And this is an interesting point is it didn't come like a presence. It just came as a thought. David started thinking about, I wonder how strong my army is. I wonder how many people I have. That's how it started. But the Bible says that Satan stood up to do that. Well, God gave him a choice. He said, look, there's a consequence to your action because you were commanded to never number the people. He said, your strength and even uh, his, uh, 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 his, what would you say, his chief soldier uh, refused, Job refused to count all the people. He said, no, I, I'm not going to do it. But he, he did it to honor David because he was king. But when it got to counting priests and things like that, he said, I'm not going to do it. You know, it, it just smote his own conscience. He knew what the word said. So anyway, it gets down to the end. And uh, again, the angel is destroying. And David realizes, wow, I'm causing this destruction in Jerusalem. And he falls down and he says to God, he said, God, these people are innocent. I'm the guilty one. Let it fall on me. And then uh, David also offered a sacrifice and, and, uh, and God stopped the angel, it said. He said, no more, enough. So we see that uh, uh, the point I was making was the contrast between the angels. They're always executing God's will and they're not doing it out of anger frustration, irritation, fear, all of these things that we see manifesting in these people who have an evil spirit that the, the Bible represents here. And uh, it's so important for us to acknowledge that because we can discern uh, for ourselves when we're dealing with an evil spirit or we might be entertaining an angel unawares. 
okay? So another place I wanted to bring out uh, that was, uh, I think it's a good point here is uh, in, um, which account here did I write down? Did I write that down? Oh yeah, let's go to Luke. This is a good point here. Now think about this. We just read about the seven sons of Sceva, seven men, okay? Seven men could not overpower one man that was possessed with one devil, okay? Now it doesn't tell you how many evil spirits are in this man, but it sounds like just one. But these seven men were not able to overpower this one devil in one man. How is that possible? Was he the first Bruce Lee? <laughs> the first Kwai Chang King? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think anybody knew martial arts back then. But what he was, was he was using this man's body to its fullest potential beyond what it was actually designed to be used, but it was capable of. You know, they say that, that when we've heard testimonies, I've read many testimonies about somebody just lifting up a car in a panic to help somebody. Now, physically, that person couldn't go out and lift a car, but it shows you the capability that is within our body when it's connected to our mind without compromise. And that's what the devil does. The devil uses your body without any recognition of what it's doing to your body, okay? That could be an angel, though, helping you lift the car. Yeah, it, it could very well be. But I'm just saying in this, in, to relate this point, is that, you know, we have things in our body like you start to feel strain, you stop. Why do you stop? Because you know that strain, if you go any further, could, could be an injury, okay? But the devil does that without regard to those senses. He uses your body beyond what you would of your own free will use. And, and that's the point I'm making is that this one devil in this man uh, just overthrew all these, all seven of them. And they ran out wounded and naked. But listen to this account in Luke chapter eight. It says, and it came to pass, verse one, that he went throughout every city, Jesus, and every village preaching and showing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God and the 12 were with him. And a certain woman, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom went seven devils. So one person with the spirit of God can cast out seven devils, or we saw last week over a thousand devils. How is that possible for them to be in one person? Again, because they're just spirit. And spirit has no volume, you might say, or mass. So you could have as many in you as you'll allow. I'm not encouraging you to experiment in that area <laughs> because it could be to your demise. <laughs> but the point I want to make is that one person who believes in their authority and uh, and knows their relationship and authority with God has power over evil spirits, no matter how many are in a person and inhabiting a person. Another thing I wanted to connect here with this verse, which had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, in many cases throughout the scriptures, you'll see that evil spirits are always connected to an infirmity or a disease or some type of malady. Okay, and it's important to note that because you'll know who you're addressing when you're being challenged. And uh, a scripture that really, really uh, like the Lord used to like uh, connect all these dots together to the point of revelation in me was in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, that says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power and he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And that just speaks to this point we're talking about. When you have believed on God and received his power, 
you have the ability to free others of the oppression of the devil. And that's exactly what happens is when you're freeing somebody, you're actually delivering them of the devil. You're delivering them of what's causing their oppression. And it could be manifesting mentally, emotionally, and physically. Amen? Do you know that most people that I have met or known of that have like mental oppression or what we call, what they call today, uh, uh, you know, psychiatric disorders or whatever, they always have some physical problem too. And why do they have that? Because the oppression of the devil. And even if they didn't start off with it, the enemy's right there to create physical problems. You know, someone I'm thinking of, a uh, of Nicole Marbach, uh, who was delivered of, you know, PTSD, bipolar, um, uh, you know, self-injury, uh, hurting herself and, uh, and, you know, I don't know what else they called it, but, you know, mental disease, uh, everything that she, uh, manifested was demonic. It was the devil working through her and she was cutting herself. She was, uh, drinking alcohol to excess to destroy her. She had an eating disorder that was all to destroy her physical body. Okay. It wasn't for her benefit. And uh, so the same thing was happening here with, with Mary Magdalene in the very exact same way. Now go with me to uh, Matthew chapter 12. Uh, I think this is a, a good point to connect this all together here, uh, those little pieces here. And uh, it's interesting that in the early part of this chapter, uh, they accuse Jesus of casting out devils by Beelzebub. And Jesus explains that even Satan's not that stupid, <laughs> because if a kingdom's divided against itself, it can't stand. And then he goes on to talk about uh, towards the, uh, uh, later on in the chapter, he says in verse 43 of, uh, Matthew 12, he says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. So this is an important point. It means that an unclean spirit can be within a man. I mean, that sounds like very simple, but how many times have you read over this point? Okay. Are you a human being? Then you're a man. And that means an evil spirit can inhabit you, can go, be in you, okay? Why is that important to understand? So you know who your adversary is, okay? Someone comes to you and you're having a, 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 you know, a, a hard time with something or you're struggling in your life and they tell you, oh, uh, you're just bipolar. You just need this medicine and that will help you. Then what are you going to do? You're going to remain bipolar your whole life because you're not recognizing that somehow I yielded to an evil spirit and he's divided me inside to where I'm thinking two with two opposite minds. And that's causing me to oppose myself. Okay, so it's important to understand this point. And Jesus says, when the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places seeking rest and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house. See, see, the devil thinks that wherever he is, it belongs to him. Know anybody like that? Selfish, self-centered. Okay, where's that coming from? That's the way an evil spirit thinks. He saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. And, he, and then he goeth and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. And Jesus says, even so shall it be also to this wicked generation. I'll address that first, the last statement first. The reason Jesus said that is because he said, look, I'm here casting out devils and I'm freeing people of this. But if they don't fill their house with truth, uh, the enemy's going to take advantage and gain habitation in them again. So he said, this is what's going to happen. They're going to see me hang on a tree and think I'm cursed of God. And whoosh, 
they're going to allow all the evil spirits back because they think, wow, I really wasn't delivered. Whatever the enemy would tell them to get his place back. And that's what happened here. Jesus is describing a scenario on what happens when a man, when an unclean spirit is cast out and you don't do anything to to recognize or to fill your house with truth so that the enemy will have no place there, then the enemy realizes that, hey, I don't have any rest or expression if I'm not in somebody with those faculties of expression. So he goes and he's willing to compromise and share his house with other evil spirits just so he can have a place back in this man. And that's what happened. So um, I think we've covered that point uh, pretty well to show that uh, an evil spirit uh, dwells within a person. They influence their behavior, their attitude. Everything about them is manifested. So how do they get this place? And I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to finish this point. Um, But here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to say, let's look at an example of how Satan got a place and how he manifested his place uh, to the destruction of the one that he inhabited or that he worked through. And I'm going to talk about someone we all know really well. His name is Judas, okay? And the reason I'm picking him is because, turn with me to Luke 2 and you'll see why. Luke 22, sorry. In Luke 22, it says, Now the feast, verse 1, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might kill him, Jesus, for they feared the people. Then Satan entered into Judas, named Iscariot, being a number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted covenanted with him to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. And uh, so notice this. It says Satan entered into Judas to do what? To betray him, okay? Another part of the personality of the devil is Again, he's looking for some angle to oppose what God has for mankind. Notice here in, um, let's see, go with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. It's expressed with little more detail here, and I think it's important that we read this as well. In uh, verse 1, it says of 13, Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were into the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had you know, given all things into his hands. So notice how it's worded here, is that the devil put it into his heart. Okay? How did he put it into his heart? Well, how did it get into his heart to even want to betray Jesus? He'd been with Jesus for three years. He'd been with Jesus. Okay? This was the beginning of the fourth year. Go back with me one chapter to 12 to 12 to 12. Okay, <laughs> Okay, chapter 12. And in chapter 12, did I write that down? I didn't. Uh, it's in chapter 12 here, yeah. This is, this is why it says in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse uh, 27, to neither give place to the devil. I'm going to read this one scripture And then you're going to have to join me next week where I will complete uh, this teaching. In uh, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, 
was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which would betray him, said, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now listen to this commentary. Then he said, This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the bag and bare that which was put therein. Do you see this right here? What was, what was in his heart that caused him to say what he said? Okay? Well, there was greed in his heart. You know, it says in uh, 1 Timothy, let me just read that. I know I said one, but this will be two. Uh, in 1 Timothy 6, let, let me just read you a scripture. It says, uh, But they that be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drowned men in destruction and perdition. You know that Judas is called the son of perdition? Jesus called him that. But notice verse 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil, while which some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Wow. Doesn't that just describe what happened that we read to Judas? We don't hear the end yet. I haven't read that yet. But notice how that all started with his love or his agreement or his coveting something. A sin. Where did the sin come from? It started with a thought in his mind where he began to value money or the, or the desire for money more than he valued the things he was receiving from Jesus. So I'm going to end on that note and I'll pick up at that place uh, next week and we will, I promise, Lord willing, I should qualify that. Uh, conclude this teaching next Sunday. So thanks for joining.